Do that. Hey, hey, we're live. Calling Chris Anderson in London. This is Chris Anderson in London calling Rick Byer in Chicago. I'm here. Hi. Greetings. How are you? I'm doing well. Sunny day in London today, so that was that was a good thing. Fantastic. Although I heard that snow might be in the forecast. They are talking about that, but you know, it, it's the London version of snow, so it kind of looks like the coconut on top of a cake <laughs> kind of thing. It's not a shovel thing. Well, we'll make a moment for everybody to join us and get started for real. And uh, please post and let us know uh, you're here and where you're watching from. And we're here every Sunday at 4 p.m. Eastern on the Stephen Ambrose Historical Tours Facebook and YouTube pages. So, uh, And all of those shows are archived. All 53 previous shows are archived on the Stephen Ambrose Historical Tours YouTube page. Okay, I got that all out, Chris. Yeah. Woo! <laughs> got through it. Um, and uh, we have uh, we have a great show today, which we'll get to uh, after the open, but we also have a little treat at the end. So we want yes. uh, folks to stick around to the end because we have a little something unusual coming up right at the end of our show as well. So we're pretty excited about that. And Chris, who do we have uh, joining oh, us? Great. We have uh, Valerie from Normandy, so that's good. Uh, John from Toronto. Doreen. Nancy. Who says it's a bit chilly in Houston, which I find unusual as well. I see Ted is here, so that, yeah. he, that he must have gotten done with his lacrosse game. And uh, Marcus finally showed up, so I feel better. Now, Marcus Getting wasn't here early. That's a little oh, a little of concern, I know. Yeah. Uh, and and we should say Happy Easter to everyone. So Happy it is Easter, it is a holiday. I'm sure that uh, we'll get some extra people watching on the tape delay because uh, because they're celebrating uh, Easter in some appropriate way uh, in the Better. live show. Yes. But Chris, I think, what do you think? Are we are we close enough that we can uh, we can get started? I believe so. I believe so. Are you ready? All right. <laughs> The bar is open. The bar is open, and the floor is yours. Well, thank you. Um, well, I'm very excited, as I guess you figured out about the show this week. Uh, our guest this week is David O'Keefe, and David is a professor of history at Marianopolis College. Uh, if you are living in Canada, you will probably recognize him. He has um, written, produced, and appeared in a number of documentaries uh, that were widely seen in Canada. Uh, Probably most well known as Dieppe Uncovered and the Black Watch Snipers. Uh, and he is the co creator of the History Channel's War Junk television show. Uh, when he's not, you know, wasting time doing all of that, he's writing books, uh, amongst which are um, One Day in August, The Untold Story Behind Canada's Tragedy at Dieppe, and Seven Days in Hell, which we'll be talking about uh, this week. He has received uh, numerous awards, uh, lots of them with royal and official in the title. Um, but uh, for our purposes, he's also a, a veteran of the Black Watch of Canada. But despite all of these accomplishments, there were, he, he felt there was something missing. And, and it was because he had yet to appear on History Happy Hour, so we're going to give him an opportunity to scratch that itch. So, David, yeah. thank you so much for joining us. Well, thank you. Very historic moment with us today, <laughs> certainly. I this mean, could, it, could be it, the it, pinnacle of your career. I think it is. I think it is. And we better be recording. Oh, okay. yes. Those oh, don't worry. <laughs> don't well, worry. happy Easter. Happy, happy Easter. Easter. Happy Easter to you. Did you bring a cocktail to happy hour? Uh, yes, I did. Uh, something uh, rather appropriate, a little single malt for today, considering we're talking about the Black Watch. Wonderful. Excellent. And Mr. Rick, you... uh, I have, uh, you know, a beer in my psychological operations glass. So that's the uh, you know, uh, science. Pers persuade, change, and influence. Oh, hold on, hold on. There's something happening over here. Uh... Okay. <laughs> Okay, it definitely <laughs> must be Easter. It's, it's the Vorpal Bunny. Either that or it's the Bunny from Monty Python. Yeah, I was going to say, that's what I thought. Yeah. <laughs> well, I, this is a surprise to me, and I <laughs> will be talking about this later. <laughs> happy Easter. Happy and, Easter. And befitting our happy and, and cheery topic today. Yes. Oh, yes. Yes. Well, um, for, uh, our topic today is... Um, Thank you. <laughs> we're going to be talking about um, one very special regiment in the Canadian Army, the Black Watch of Canada, and uh, basically focusing in on one week uh, in Normandy, uh, one terrible week for the regiment. Mm -hmm. um, and it's something that uh, I think is an important book, not only because of it tells the story of a regiment that I care a great deal about, but it also I think does a really wonderful job of illustrating 
just how terrible the fighting in Normandy really was. Mm. And I think sometimes we sort of lose sight of that. We talk about the guys land on the beach and then... Yeah. You know, but what we're going to talk about today happens a month after the landing, and it's it's just horrific. So um, we'll get into the weeds here. So, David, just I mean, for starters, just for you know, since we have a lot of Americans in the audience, can mm -hmm. you tell us a little bit about what the Black Watch is and why it's such a special regiment? And sure. Kind yeah, of I guess. Uh, in, yeah, in Canada, I mean, the Black Watch of Canada, and there is an Imperial Black yep. Watch over in Scotland. So. Um, and the Black Watch here took their name from that uh, just before the First World War and kind of earned their spurs in the trenches of the First World War. And as a matter of fact, when they come out of the trenches in 1918, um, they are very much in the Canadian Army scheme of things, very much the way we would see the New York Yankees of baseball, Montreal Canadiens, Manchester United. They are the creme de la creme, and certainly they know that. Um, they recruited, and of course, you know, up here in Canada, we're, we're along the lines of the British tradition, or at least we were at this time. In other words, we have regiments which are recruited from certain regimental areas. And the Black Watch is Montreal-based. When Montreal used to be the center of the universe in Canada, now, of course, it's Toronto. But when Montreal was the, the mover and shaker of, um, of Canada, the Black Watch, of course, was able to recruit and recruit heavily, not only here, but other parts as well. We'll get into that in a bit. But um, they, um, they perpetuated three battalions, which was unheard of. And they were able to sustain three battalions for about two years. Uh, two of them fought through the entire war. One of them was in and out relatively quickly. But the big claim to fame for the Black Watch was all three of them were standing essentially shoulder to shoulder together at Vimy Ridge when Vimy Ridge was captured in 1917, which is the pinnacle of Canadian military history. Right. So you can imagine, you know, and when they came out of the, you know, they came out of the trenches, they had the most battle honors of any regiment. They had the most individual honors. Six Victoria Cross uh, uh, recipients were part of their ranks. And um, they emerged with an attitude and a swagger, well-earned, um, but it was something that they definitely took into World War II, without a doubt. Yeah. Now, David, and, and correct me if I'm wrong, there are a number of Americans. That the regiment had a tradition of recruiting in, Amer in America from the First World War. Yeah, it's probably one of the best kept, you know, best kept secrets of the Black Watch was in World War I to help fill out the ranks of those three battalions. We were pretty much soaking Montreal dry, so we ended up moving down and going towards the Boston area into Philadelphia, New York as well. So you had a, a relatively sizable contingent of Americans who decided they were going to join the Black Watch before the United States was in World War I. Well, the same thing happens in World War II. In 1939, 40, and 41, before Pearl Harbor, you see Americans who, you know, for whatever reason, they decide they want to get into war for their own reasons, mostly because they figured it was the right thing to do. Um, we're looking for, a, a, you know, a ride, if you will. And a lot of times the, the Black Watch name that had come out of World War I, of course, had a real brand recognition in the United States. So, you know, there's certainly at least one gentleman that I talk about in the book, uh, Bill Booth, came up from Florida. And he came up from Florida because he thought he was joining the Black Watch in Scotland and had no clue that there was a Canadian Whoops. Black Watch. You know, geography yeah. is not always the strong point of many Americans. Yeah, well, you know, at least he found the Black Watch. That was his main objective. Right. Right. Yeah, he was thinking of going to India, as a matter of fact. I think he said, if I'm not mistaken, he had seen the Shirley Temple classic oh. Wee Willie Winky which happened to have the Black Watch in it. He just thought one Black Watch was the other Black Watch and ended up in Montreal. So there you go. <laughs> Yeah, well, looking at uh, the story in Normandy, uh, I, I guess I would say uh, you sh we should get a little background here on how this this uh, this battalion that's that's part of a, a regiment in in uh, in Canada how it ends up in Normandy, where it mm. ends up, you know, what they're doing, and they're under, of course, the British command there in uh, in Normandy. Yeah, they are. I mean, uh, overall British command, if you will. I mean, like everybody. Right. Normandy, I mean, they're reporting under, to under the British. Under Montgomery's. Yeah, yeah. Exactly. Under Montgomery's uh, 21st Army Group. Yeah, they arrive. And, it, you know, Chris mentioned it right off the top. You know, a lot of times when we look at Normandy, we, you know, we look at Saving Private Ryan. We look at the opening on Omaha Beach and we figured, oh, my God, they overcame it. And that was it. The Germans packed up shop and went home. But what we tend to forget is, you know, over the next 76 days, Normandy devolves into a slugfest. 
and it is uh, almost up there when it comes to the percentage of losses as you would find in World War One at you know at Passchendaele or the Somme. I mean, this is a heavy infantry slog, and a lot of people tend to forget that, and certainly the Americans in the Bocage, but also with the British and the Canadian forces uh, that have landed on, uh, you know, on uh, Gold, Juno, and Sword beaches, and have pushed up to the Norman capital of Caen, and it's taken a while for them to actually reach Caen, the city, and then the Germans basically abandon it. The Canadians and the British take it, but then there's the big defensive. Um, area south of Caen, which is the Verrier Bourgeois Ridge or feature, that really then becomes the main hinge in the entire German defense in Normandy. And it takes about six weeks of tough fighting, tough, hard nosed fighting, like I said, a real infantry slugfest, um, to be able to just sort of wrestle to that point by the end of July. And there's a lot of fear. There's a lot of fear within Allied High Command. Uh, that the Germans are going to somehow be able to wrestle them into a standstill or a stalemate. And that's something that has huge operational and political, you know, potential political repercussions because, of course, in the United States, you have FDR who's just announced that he is going to run for the fourth consecutive term. So there's a lot of political pressure that's being put on Eisenhower for a relatively quick victory in Normandy. But the reality on the ground is not playing nice for the politicians. And of course, that's also creating a huge amount of strain on the relationship between Montgomery and Eisenhower. And of course, Montgomery is you know, responsible for the day-to-day -day actions. He's got the first army, the US army, he's got the second British army. And under that, the second Canadian Corps arrives in late July, and the Black Watch are part of the 2nd Canadian, 5th Brigade of the second Canadian Division, part of the second Canadian Corps, of second british army so that's where the order of battle comes in and they're inserted into the line after about 10 days of what they call inoculation and they're inserted south of calm or actually just uh in the middle of calm to be honest with you um and their first uh their first kick of the can or the first uh, chance at battle is uh, july 18th 19 uh, 1944 which is the first of the seven days that i cover in the book so, uh, David, leading leading up to this, just again, so to familiarize some of the Americans mm -hmm. in the audience, I want you to describe um, kind of some of the Canadian personalities or commanders, because obviously we know about Bradley and we know about Hubner and Maxwell Taylor, but who are some of the I guess, mm. kind of the decision makers that the the Canadians are working with here? Well, this time it's it's very interesting because the Canadians come into Normandy in a very incremental way. In other words, we don't arrive with 1st Canadian Army. 1st Canadian Army eventually sets itself up once there's enough elbow room in the bridgehead, okay? So basically we have one Canadian division and an armored brigade, the 3rd Canadian Division, which lands on D-Day and continues to fight. So around July 6th is when the rest of the 2nd Canadian Division arrives and now we set up the 2nd Canadian Corps. And that is under Guy Simmons, G Lieutenant General Guy Simmons. And you notice I said Lieutenant, not Lieutenant, right? Yep. Because we're t dealing with Canadian and British ranks. So Lieutenant General Guy Simmons, you can see him in the middle. And he was considered by some to be Canada's mo uh, ablest general, perhaps their greatest general. He was a Montgomery protege, as you can see, you know, he wore the beret like him, had the mustache like him. He was um, tough, he was stern, he was autocratic in his command style, he was a gunner by training, he was from the artillery arm. And he had been number one at Royal Military College, which is our version of West Point. Um, and he was a mover and shaker. He had fought in Sicily, had a division command in Sicily and in Italy, and then was promoted. And this was going to be his big debut. And under his corps, now you have the um, Armour Brigade, the Canadian Armour Brigade that is fighting. But you also have the veteran 3rd Division, which slammed ashore at Juneau Beach and has been fighting ever since. And now the 2nd Canadian Division, whose claim to fame up until this point was that one day in August in 1942 where they were mercilessly mm. ripped apart on the shores of Dieppe. And now this is the first time they were getting back into battle. And they have a commander by the name of uh, Major General Charles Fawkes, who was the one I believe on the left uh, of the photograph. Yeah, you can see my left or 
you know. And, it's to uh, the left. It's it's, it's, it's to the left. It's yeah. everybody's okay. left. Somebody's <laughs> left. It's everybody's Somebody's left. left. <laughs> yes, yes. He's the yeah, the one looking to the right, and he has his finger pointed down. Yeah, you can see it with his name. Uh, with his name uh, under. That's with one his way name to under. I mean, that's you know probably the easiest way to figure out who it is. Yeah, exactly. Um, Fouts was interesting. Nobody could really figure out how Fouts reached the rank he did. As a matter of fact, he was probably, um, and I think I'm being overly fair here, to say he was probably one of the biggest and best brown nosers in the entire Canadian <laughs> Army. Um, well, that's the, po that's set, the positive view. It actually said, don't laugh at it. I mean, it says that in his file. One of the big strengths is his ability to please his masters, basically, is what it's saying. So, but Simmons really didn't like him. Nobody, he had... Problems of personality, to say the least. Yeah. Uh, and then, of course, you know, one of the big problems was he had no experience in battle. Simmons did. And so everything that Simmons did, it wasn't a question of, you know, uh, jump. It was how high do you want me to jump? Right. And that trickles down in 2nd Canadian Division. That goes not only from Fawkes, but also down to the Brigade Commander, where the Black Watch is in, 5th Canadian Infantry Brigade. Um, McGill, McGill, Brigadier uh, William McGill. It's M-E-G. Okay, not MC, like the university. Um, and he is a, a signaler by trade. He was in wireless all his life. And um, he was in the tiny, what we call the tiny permanent force. Before yeah. the war, Canada only had a very tiny army of about maybe 10,000 people, 10,000 men at that time. And so as a result, there was a clique that developed and you had the militia trained soldiers and officers like those in the Black Watch. So in other words, these were not so much National Guard, but, you know, not too far off. And then you had somebody like McGill, who made his career in the armed forces. And so there is a, a common um, understanding mm -hmm. that there was two kind of, vein, you know, two strains, if you will, of the commanders. Those who could go back to civilian life if they screwed up on the battlefield <laughs> because they had their own fortunes. Right. And those like McGill, who were company men, and this was their entire profession. So some people have suggested he was promoted way above his ceiling because of the fact he had nowhere else to go after becoming a colonel. And the only way he could become a general was to actually command troops in battle. So that's the, that's the overall scenario, you know, for the... And, for and the, the dynamic command. between those guys, I mean, and we can touch on this again later, but briefly, it's a dynamic that essentially helps pave the way to disaster for the Black Watch, isn't it? Without a doubt, it's, it's, I would argue, and I did in the book, completely dysfunctional. You have two subordinates in your division commander and your brigadier who are terrified to take the initiative because they know that Simmons is extremely, like I said, extremely autocratic. He's extremely arrogant because, you know, he has battle experience. As a matter of fact, you know, at one point he said, look, you know, when the music starts playing, you just follow it and I'll call the variations. In mm -hmm. other words, you know, you, you just follow what I have to say. Mm -hmm. Don't bother thinking for yourself. I can't be and, wrong. I can't be no, wrong. No, exactly. I can't be wrong. But what yeah. this does is it creates a, a, a paralysis of initiative, if you will, down at the lower levels. Because, you know, as you know, I mean, you can be removed and it doesn't matter how far up the chain you are and, and it doesn't matter how good your intelligence is and your communications are. There is a certain amount of... Um, you know, understanding of the nuance at the front line. And you have to be able to have that, you know, rapport that moves back and forth with the with your units in the front to be able to have, as the Germans call it, a fingertip feel of what's going on in the field. Simmons is not like that. Simmons is very much like a maestro. In other words, here's the concerto, everybody follow the music, and if I decide, and when I decide, and only I decide, when we're going to change. Well, and so that becomes a very, very difficult command climate, as you can imagine. Yeah, I was going to say, one of the things I'm curious about is obviously with the Black Watch, you know, you're, I think it's fair to say you're, you're dealing with some ego. Oh, yeah. Um, and they have over them this kind of dysfunctional command structure. So a, as they're going into combat in Normandy, do you have any sense of, are the guys in the in the regiment saying, who are these clowns above us, or it's all good, or oh, yeah. are they, what's their kind of... Heart yeah, part of part of the Black Watch attitude, as I mentioned, or mystique, as you know, we we termed it earlier, is the fact that nobody is going to tell the Black Watch how to do something. You know, in other words, you can tell us what needs to be done, 
just don't tell us how to do it. And part of that had to do with this incredible legacy coming out of World War I. And also, too, you do have, like, for instance, the colonel who is leading the Black Watch into battle, Stuart <clears throat> Cantley, graduated, like Simmons, number one from Royal Military College. So there is, you know, there, there is a, some professional egos here. But also, you remember that the Black Watch is made up specifically of, you know, working class kids from the Anglophone areas of Montreal, predominantly the Irish and the Scots and, you know, the English. And then you have their officers and their officers are all coming from the movers and shakers of Canada. They're all captains of industry, politicians. You know, one of the uh, one of the men that I follow in this is the prime minister's nephew, the former prime minister, R.B. Bennett, his nephew is one of the company commanders. And so the Black Watch is known as kind of like the old family regiment. Mm -hmm. In other words, it's a blue chip regiment, if you will. So any time that any kind of decision is made, um, the Black Watch are sure to put their voices out there. In other words, they're <laughs> sure to be heard, if you know what I mean. Yeah, In other yeah, words, yeah. you better do right by our regiment. Right. Yeah. But but it doesn't start off too well. So on the 18th, like they're, no. they're they're they're. I mean, their their hard knocks start right out of the gate. There's very little in the uh, you know. There's no easy into this. Yeah, no, no, there's no easy. I mean, they do. You know, they land on the sixth, like the rest of it, the sixth of right. July, and then they spend about twelve days in this inoculation. So basically, they're going around doing some patrols and sniper hunting and things like this, and just getting used to what it's like being under fire for the first time. Because remember, they've essentially sat in England training for four years up until this point. Uh, the only time they sent one company, 120 men into Dieppe, and they never came back. So they replaced that company. But you can imagine what it's like. And, you know, think about, you know, we, we're all sports fans here. We were talking about that before we came on. You can only play so many Grapefruit League games before you start to get stale, right? You've got to be able to see action. And, of course, um, combat, you can be so well trained for it, but it there's no substitute for experience. There are a billion little things, particularly in infantry combat, that you need to be able to pick up on the field of battle that you're not going to get training in England. So as well-trained as you are, you are still green when you're going into battle. There's no substitute for combat. So that's basically what we're getting now, is that the Black Watch, as you mentioned, go into battle on July 18th, and they have, they're have they given the, the, the honor of leading the division and its breakout through Caen over a little part of the Orne River uh, in the southern part of Caen. If you've ever been to Caen, you know what it's like. You drive through to the south as you're heading south towards Verrières, and it's a tiny little river. I mean, it's only about maybe 30 yards wide. And this is their first, uh, this is their first show. And they're told to basically bounce the Orn. And it's supposed to be relatively simple. They're supposed to be going against rear German rear guards because the Germans are pulling back now. They pulled out through um, Caen. They're moving back towards Verrier Ridge. And opening night jitters. That's about it. Somebody, after training for four years, misses or mi mixes up a simple timing. What time do they have to be in position to cover the troops that are going to make this assault boat crossing across the river? And it goes off the rails really quick. And an entire company of the Black Watch, 120 men are lost, just trying to get across this river, which was supposed to be a very simple way of, you know, kicking in the door and moving on. And that was, um, I, I, I guess you could say, a warning of what was to come for them in some cases. Yeah. So uh, that's the beginning of the seven days uh, in hell, in essence, and the the, uh, the it's 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 very bad at the beginning. Then things improve a bit uh, and and set us up for uh, to to take us to what happens on July twenty fifth, uh, which is the which is the which is the day that they launch their assault at. Uh, uh, at Verrier Ridge, and uh, so so, how does this? What what is this assault part of? What's happening that puts them okay. in the position that they're going to be there? Okay, well, they start off like I said on the 18th, and this is part of the Canadian subsidiary operation known as Atlantic. It's part of uh, Montgomery's Goodwood operation, and um, as they cross the river, they basically, you know, they take it on the chin, and their pride is hurt without a doubt. And then in the next series of engagements, they're able to capture a German outpost 
and then they're called in when there's an emergency. The Germans launch a counterattack from Verrieres um, as General Simmons, fighting his first battle, overextends one of the other brigades, the 6th Brigade. And so as a result, they get hit by some uh, very tough customers. They get hit by the 1st SS Panzer Division. And as you can imagine, these are veterans of the Eastern Front uh, who play for keeps, to say the least. And so as a result, there's a lot of panic in 2nd Canadian Division. And the Black Watch are thrown up to restore the line on a godforsaken hill called Hill 61. And if you've ever been to Verrier, it actually is slightly below Verrier and across the valley. So any of the Germans on Verrier have a perfect view of everything that's happening on Hill 61. So the Black Watch end up inheriting this place. And basically, they're an exposed um, uh, advanced slope where they have to dig in in wheat because the whole area is covered in wheat. And they, you know, of course, the French have been evacuated. They haven't been harvesting. So now the wheat is standing literally waist or shoulder high. And, and, and we should, us, and I just yeah. to interrupt, just because for people who've been to Normandy, I think most of mm -hmm. our American visitors to Normandy or in hedgerow country. This yeah. is not really hedgerow no, country. Is of, this is more oh, open fields of wheat uh, yep. rather than uh, a, a there tiny there little go. hedgerow of wheat. Yeah, exactly. And that's that's the thing that changes the dynamic. When you have, you know, you're fighting in the Bocage country, it's very short, sharp fights. Here, it's very much like World War One, as I mentioned, up in Flanders, where you are advancing steadily and relatively slowly up a steady incline for two or three kilometers or you know a mile and a half at a at a time so this is very difficult which requires then that all the elements of your force come together so in other words the artillery the tank support uh you know the air force if they're available etc to be able to cover that kind of ground without being massacred but, um, you know, to get there, I mean, that was one of the big problems, you know, when the Black Watch ended up on Hill 61 and they had to stay there for four days. It kind of reminds me, and I've said this before, in Band of Brothers, in, uh, you know, the Ardennes, you know, the Bastogne. They have their Bastogne for the Black Watch right out of the gate. There's no winter, there's no cold, but they're getting, you know, high temperatures, and then one day it'll be raining and the next day it'll be high, high heat. And then, of course, they're in an environment that they've never trained in. Because in England, and a lot of people don't realize this, you could not train in wheat because it was scarce and they were using it for food. So you were prohibited from going into wheat fields. So now you're in a completely foreign environment where you have to dig in with the wheat all around you. And, of course, you're facing an enemy who has fought in this terrain for three and a half years in Russia and they know all the yeah. tricks of the trade. Well, yeah, I mean, I think it's important for people to know that, you know, the the, the 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 opposition particularly against the canadians um this isn't you know russian conscripts or ost volunteers or or unit this is they're they're going up against the a team and and one yes. quote i wanted to read this is from your book um this is from an american who's fighting with mm -hmm. the canadians robert rig and he says the ss were unmitigated bastards in every sense of the word they were all psychopaths totally imbued with the fil filthy Nazi credo and remorseless killers of both prisoners and wounded. They were hated by the Wehrmacht almost as much as by us. The ordinary jury would fight one hell of a battle, but if all was lost, he would surrender or retreat, not the SS. They fought to the death, and they were killed as they deserved. This is brutal mm. stuff. This is not... Yeah, nice. Yeah, and it's very symbolic of the relationship. Of course, um, I'm not sure if uh, any of your uh, viewers uh, would know, but you know the Canadians and the British had a very um, difficult time with the 12th SS Panzer Division on yeah. D-Day and the days leading. I mean, close to 300 British and Canadian prisoners were murdered by members of the 12th SS over you know a couple of days after uh, D-Day. So by the time that this is all cooking and you've got the rest of the SS divisions coming in, you can imagine the kind of relationship that has been built up, particularly between Canadian units and the SS. Yeah. And as you mentioned, it is the A-team, um, you know, the best that Hitler has left to throw. Uh, he's doing it. I mean, they've got the first SS, the, the Hitler bodyguard. They have what's left of the 12th SS. Um, they're battle groups of the second Panzer Division, which is one of the best that the Wehrmacht have to offer. Plus you have the two Panzer Divisions, SS Panzer Divisions, that would later make their, <coughs> their fame and fortune, if you will, at Arnhem, the 9th and 10th SS Panzer Division. 
So, you know, you are literally going up the, against the best in what essentially is your first battle. So I don't think you could have much more of a David and Goliath kind of matchup going mm, in right. to start. Mm. Well, and I, I want to um, take a look at what happened on the, on the 25th. Mm -hmm. And um, we, we, I, 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 I did not take this from your book. I, I was looking for a, a, a simplified version of this map. But in essence, the Black Watch uh, on the left, they are, they are, they're going to be, they're part of a larger attack, which is, I think, Operation Spring. Is that right? Yes, Operation and, Spring. Yeah. Yeah, and so you see, there's an attack going on by the Canadians, the infantry, the various uh, parts of it, and they're going to be trying to attack towards this town, uh, Fontenay, uh, Le Marmion. And to do that, they have to go over this ridge, uh, Verrier Ridge, and that's kind of the sticking point. And they hope to have uh, tank support for this. Doesn't quite work out, uh, and it it uh, it ends up. I, honestly, um, David, reading your book, it it feels a little bit. It's a smaller scale. It feels a little. What happens feels a little bit like Pickett's Charge at the Battle mm. of Gettysburg. You know. Uh, uh, so tell yeah. us tell us what goes on there. Give us the overview. Well, essentially, I mean, by the time we get to it, it's a locomotive that's, you know, going off the rails. The entire train is a runaway train by the time the Black Watch actually make their attack. Uh, one of the big problems, of course, is General Simmons, uh, Guy Simmons, is trying to, I would argue, impress. He's trying to make his mark. He would like to get Verrier Ridge. He wants it as his Vimy Ridge of World War II. And so as a result, he comes up with a monster of a plan. It's overly complex. It's overly complicated. It has a series of phases, basically three phases, plus an option, depending on how you're doing at the end. And it's uh, overly ambitious, uh, given the fact that the Germans, over the preceding days leading up to this attack on July 25th, are pulling out all the stops and moving their reserves south of the ridge. Um, he's, you know, he understands he's getting top-notch intelligence either through signals intelligence or he's getting it through ultra. He knows what it's looking like and he starts scaling it back a little bit in his mind. He was hoping to break through originally. But even his, realized, even his commander, right? Even uh, General Dempsey, the British uh, yeah. uh, commander, he, he doesn't think this is really going to work. But he's sort of like, well, okay, you can try. I'll give you a little rope, but not too much. Yeah, that's a great way of putting it, because what's happening is they're looking at the intelligence picture and they're realizing that Verrier Ridge every single day leading up to the 25th is getting a, becoming a tougher nut to crack. So it starts off in the planning around the 19th of July as this breakthrough operation. In other words, let's reach Falaise, let's finish off what Goodwood couldn't do. And then the sober reality for most people, <laughs> most, most of the commanders start to sink in and eventually Dempsey has to kind of rein in Simmons to a tad and he actually puts a time limit on this so he basically says you know if you don't get the ridge by the 20 by noon on the 25th and the operation is supposed to start in the middle of the night so basically he's got about eight hours eight hours to get the ridge then Dempsey is going to call it off but this becomes one of the problems we understand why Dempsey is doing this but basically, um, Simmons does not interpret this as a, as a word of caution. I would argue he sees it more of a challenge. In other words, now I have till noon to get the ridge, as opposed to, okay, let's see how things go, and we'll reassess, and we'll do it. You know, right, proper. so he, he reads it like the people in the TV shows when, the bus, when they say it's going to take two hours and the bus says, get it done in 30 minutes. And so he's like, all right, get it done yeah. in 30 minutes. Yeah, and, and actually, that's the kind of attitude he takes. And, you know, the problem is he's got this incredibly complex and, and complicated plan, which is based on timing. And when you have timings wed to your plan as your, you know, primordial mechanism, you're already in trouble before the plan starts. Because inevitably, the Germans are going to throw off your timing. I mean, they're masters of defense by this time. You know, they are wilting away and they're nowhere near as super as a lot of people claim they were. But they understand how the game is played, and they know how to get you off kilter. <clears throat> Pardon me. And that's exactly what happens. And so they know that uh, spring is coming. They know uh, Operation Spring, I should say. They know essentially because of all the, you know, the artillery that's ramping up, and the, you know, the uh, the two, you know, two Allied uh, armor divisions which are, you know, queuing up in the back to try to push through if, you know, if Simmons gets the ridge. They know something big is about to happen. So they end up getting the first strike in and they send, believe it or not, an airstrike 
a series of airstrikes, which is unheard of at this time. And that's how desperate the Germans were. They send a series of airstrikes at night. And they're quite successful in hitting Canadian and British command, control, and communication facilities, which immediately then throws everything off kilter. And so basically, Operation Spring, um, you know, gets behind time. They're supposed to be trying to assault Verrier at night. In other words, in the darkness, and the last push is going to be right at dawn before the Germans really have a good view. But unfortunately, they're about six hours behind. So in other words, instead of, yeah, instead of the Black Watch going in at 5.30, it's now 9.30, and they're still trying to fight to get to their start line because all hell is broken loose during the night. So now, if you're in the Black Watch, you're sitting there looking up at Verrier Ridge, the Germans, of course, are on the reverse slope in full strength, and now it's broad daylight. There's no mist, there's no half light. It is now a bright, shiny, sunshiny day. They haven't seen sun in a week, and now suddenly it comes out. And of course, so now the only thing that they have to rely on is as they're making their way for almost two and a half kilometers straight up the ridge and then over the ridge down onto that target that you showed before their objective, the town of fontenay le marmion they have a series of artillery concentrations that are going to come down and provide, if you will, a wall of steel. And they're going to have support from um, a, a troop a squadron, actually, of tanks, uh, Sherman tanks, that are going to come in apparently from the flanks. And then they're going to provide direct fire as the indirect fire comes down and then basically they're going to move it right up the ridge and then down onto their target. So you can imagine that, you know, everything has to come off according to plan and like clockwork for this to work. And of course, as you know, in combat, nothing ever goes according to plan. You have to have your branches in your sequels and that's just not built in. Well, I, you know, I, I just find it unforgivable i mean simon's obviously he's this is his first big battle but he'd been in he'd been in italy uh, to just i mean i i'd like to get into the kind of the details of the attack but um mm. i've been to where the where the attack goes in unfortunately you're, when i was there your book hadn't been written yet but 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 you, you just want to weep when you see yeah. the ground that seems yeah. to be that seems to be quite the theme in Canadian military history. Whether, <laughs> right. it be, whether it be at Dieppe or whether it be in Normandy, there's a lot of times, and of course, the Canadians do have tradition of of accepting whatever job is given to them, and, and will die trying, try attempting to do it. Right. We did that in World War One. That's why we ended up with our you know the reputation we did coming out of the trenches. And in World War Two, you could probably argue it was the same thing. And in microcosm, it's like that for the Black Watch. Um, I, to get back to what you were talking about before, Simmons, I think Simmons doesn't understand really infantry. He doesn't understand the infantry battle and he doesn't understand armor. He is a gunner and everything is about the fire plan. And he was quite successful, one would argue, as a division commander. But you're dealing with a different level when, you're, when you have a corps that is made up of infantry and armor. Because not only does he have two infantry divisions for this attack, but he also has two British armored divisions plus a Canadian armored brigade. So, you know, he's got a mixed bag and he just doesn't really understand it. Everything is methodical and plotting with him as opposed to that idea of fingertip feel, the genuine fingertip feel of understanding, you know, what's going on with your men <clears throat> in the front, how the enemy is working. It's, it's like a boxing match, you know, and he's just, um, he's not Muhammad Ali. You know, he's not. Yeah. And that's what, he's just a big slugger who comes out, and the Germans are like Ali. They, they know how to dance. They can play rope-a-dope. You know, they understand the art of it is at this particular point. Uh, you know, I, I, I just, I'm going to read a passage here, because and for people who don't know, when they read the book, they'll know more, but basically 325 young men advance across the wheat. Yeah. They go up over this cliff, and they're gone. Yeah. And this is a passage from the book that I, I found pretty compelling. Um, During the four-hour ordeal, one Black Watch man fell every 12 seconds. Every two minutes, one Highlander died in the withering German fire as they pushed up the ridge in a bid to fulfill their duty to higher authority, honor, the regiment, manhood, and, as some would say, destiny. So, you know, what happened? They... they they just disappear. Well, 
That's the thing. Uh, you know, you can imagine being in the head of the Black Watch Command at this time. Uh, unfortunately, part of the reason why they were delayed is because they lost their commanding officer, Stuart Cantley. He was mortally wounded, and his 2IC, or the guy who acted like his 2IC, was also knocked Second out. Second so in command, right? Second in command, yeah. Sorry, I'm, 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 the old army in me is coming out. And, uh, I'm, I'm, I'm good for translating that. It's, it's, a, it's, it's a great... Yeah, from <laughs> army to English, thank you. Um, so, so there's a, a bit of a paralysis, because there's a, a vacuum of power, and there's an argument going on between who's, you know, who's going to take over. Finally, there's a young major who comes in and takes over, and his name is Phil Griffin. He goes down in history because he ends up leading them up the, up the ridge. But they, the Black Watch officers do consider not going, not following orders. In other words, they're looking for anything, any legitimate way to get out of this attack, and they can't find it because they're under a direct order and the pressure is coming down. Get on. You're late. Keep going. And then finally, the brigadier issues them a direct order. You go now. And of course, when you're dealing with a regiment like the Black Watch, even though in hindsight we would say that, yes, common sense should have dictated, you're playing with something that is much more you know, powerful, and that's the concept of honor with these men. Mm -hmm. These men had grown up you know, being, you know, listening to the stories. They not only had to hold the regiment's name high, but also the names of their families. And that is quite powerful. And really, we're in a, we're kind of in a transitional phase where we're no longer, by the end of World War II, looking at warfare and leadership and et cetera like that. But the Black Watch are still kind of the old guard, yeah. if you will. And they're the slaves to their past. And it's an albatross around their neck. So as a result, eventually, they realize, look, there's no legitimate way of getting out of this and saving face. So reluctantly, they do order the attack to go ahead. And they're just basically crossing their fingers that the artillery arrives on time, that the tanks arrive on time. But of course, as you probably know, coordinating artillery is the most difficult thing in an attack. So whenever that is done, you're kind of wed to that timetable. And so as that time H hour approaches, uh, and now they're going to go up in broad daylight, the Germans are on three sides. So they're on both flanks and they're up on the other side of the ridge. The only thing they have is that artillery fire plan, really, and the tanks. So when the H hour comes at 0930, Phil Griffin gives the order to go, even though the tanks haven't arrived. And so the tanks are late. And it's inexplicable. It seems like there was an order, a counter order. Somebody called off the tank support. All the things that you could um, fear would happen in the fog of war and battle yeah. happen. So, I mean, it's, it's probably, if you want to truly learn lessons, whether it be at, you know, the War College, Staff College, or whatever else, you have to understand what happens to the Black Watch and all that entire dynamic, how it unfolds. So, yes, they do. They start marching, and they go up in what is called box formation. Two rifle companies up, two rifle companies behind. The tanks are supposed to be on the flanks. They haven't materialized, and the artillery is coming down, but it's coming down on the reverse slope and they can't see it. So as a result, a lot of the men mistakenly believed that the artillery never showed up. It did, but it was nowhere near as, as um, effective as they hoped it was going to be. So basically, the Germans just stood there and watched them come. And they started moving up from a little town called St. Martin into the wheat field. And they started moving up the wheat field, basically at a walking pace, as you normally would do to keep command and control, particularly in wheat. You go to ground in wheat, you lose everybody. So as they're going up, occasionally there was some plunging sniper fire, and then the machine guns, German machine guns, opened up. And of course, as you can imagine, the pace starts to quicken a little bit. Command and control is becoming very, very difficult as the, you know, the NCOs and the officers, the platoon commanders are yelling to their NCOs, their NCOs are yelling to their section commanders, and they're trying to keep their men together. But now, you know, men are starting to fall, men are starting to scream. They, you know, they're screaming for stretcher bearers. And then, boom, in comes the artillery, the mortars, the rockets, direct tank fire from three different sides. I mean, you mentioned Pickett's charge. It's the charge of the Light Brigade by this time. Mm. And there's no, words, there's no cover. There is absolutely no cover. What you're showing, the, the picture that you've been showing is not Verrier. It's a little bit, that's actually a little bit north of Caen. But put it this way, that's Verrier if you just tilt it up slightly. Give it a ridge. <laughs> that's it. Right, give it a little ridge. And that's how open it is. 
So you have nowhere to go except to your objective. I, and so, oh, no, yeah. I was I was going to I'm, I'm going to quote from your book. So you, you, it's OK. <laughs> you, you, you'd be good. But but there's two quotes here that really struck me as they're setting out. And one is from a German tank commander, Peter Prien, who is uh, on their flank and who is pouring horrendous fire into their position. But he said it looked like waves of men rolling steadily forward, no sign of panic despite their visible losses. To us soldiers with four or five years of experience, this was a most unreal sight. So he he can't even believe that they're doing this, and he's this is the enemy. And I, and I would balance that as you do in the book because they're on virtually the same page with a quote from Bruce Ducat, if I'm saying his name correctly. Ducat, uh, yeah, Ducat. Ducat. He, yeah. Um, Okay, duck it. Um, and he said uh, his, his description <clears throat> puts you right in the moment. The first thing you noticed was how loud it was. Machine guns firing, bullets whipping through the grain that sounded like wasps, shells landing, men shouting orders and wounded screaming, screeching metal and the clang of bullets and shell fragments meeting body armor, shovels, picks or helmets, and then the smell of the cordite from the blast, it just stunk. Yeah. Bruce, um, I was very lucky when I, when I started doing the interviews for this book. I was a young officer 30 years ago in the regiment, and when I used to go in, um, they were still around. I mean, the men would have been in their 60s at that time. And I was very lucky when they found out that I was quite serious about military history that, you know, in addition to, you know, my, my very short uh, time in the Army, that my career was definitely going to be in history. Um, I was able to gain their confidence and I was able to sit down with many of them over several years, decades actually, and get their story down. And Bruce was something else. Um, Bruce was very open, um, very open about everything. He had his vision, and of course, you know, as a historian, you're challenged with that because everybody's got a, particularly an infantryman, 50 yards wide, 50 yards deep. That's their war, right? Everything that happens. And so they're all puzzle pieces, and we have to bring these puzzle pieces together. But what was interesting was that Bruce's description is almost universal with everybody who was there. And, it, you know, whether it's the sight, the smell, the sound, and a lot of them really talked about the sound. And it was, you know, the last thing they wanted to hear was the clang of metal because they knew something was hit. It was one thing when the bullets went by and they sounded like wasps, but it was another thing when you'd hear a thuck or you'd hear a twang or a pang because you knew it had struck something. And that was the tough part. And then, of course, the artillery. You know, the artillery coming down and they're facing everything from, you know, 210 millimeter rocket shells to, you know, 150 millimeter high explosive. Uh, they're getting 81 millimeter mortars dropping in. I mean, it's, it's a carefully crafted killing ground. It's almost textbook. You know, it's right out of German doctrine. And unfortunately, you know, the tank support uh, didn't materialize uh, as it, you know, as it should have. And the, um, the artillery was relatively ineffectual. And so, you know, right from the start, even if things did come together, I really don't see how they would have been able to make it up. And so by the time they actually reached the crest of the ridge, out of the 325 men who start the assault, only 60 are left. That's it. And only 60 make it across. And out of the 325, less than 20 make it back the next day to be able to report fit for duty. So 129 men are killed and a whole bunch are wounded and others are taken prisoners, uh, prisoner of war. And uh, some of them are lucky. They end up in, uh, you know, German hospitals in France that, you know, in the next couple of weeks are overrun and they come home. But uh, Bruce Duckett doesn't. Uh, Bruce Duckett ends up in uh, a German prisoner of war camp right until the end, as well as some of the others. So Dave, so this, on that attack, they suffered 97% casualties. They've suffered, they've lost a company crossing the Orange. So in your book, it's the first yeah. seven days of combat, they suffer 72% casualties. Yeah. Um, well, I mean, two questions, really. One is, how does the regiment basically continue to function? Because they go on and they finish the war, so Great they're question. reconstituted. And then moving on from that, why don't we, the collective we, know more about this? I mean, okay. if, if you go to... New, <laughs> okay, two great questions. You go to Newfoundland Park, mm -hmm. there's always buses there, right? The Newfoundland Regiment, their moment on July 1st, 
They, uh, we all from know World about War One, right? From World War One, yeah. sorry. Yeah. We all know about Company A on Omaha Beach. Yeah. This is this is. I, I just, you I, know. I would argue it's kind of a travesty. It's fallen through the cracks, and there's a reason for that. And let, let me get to your first question first, yeah. and then we'll come back to that. I mean, the first question is, a, um, the Black Watch is not the only one to suffer heavily. I mean, they suffer the most, but the entire 2nd Division and also 3rd Division suffer very heavily in this bid to get very rich in Operation Spring. As a matter of fact, there's three big operations that are put on before the Canadians and the British finally get very rich. So you have Operation Atlantic on the 18th, you have Spring on the 25th, and finally Operation Totalize on the 8th of August, which actually brings the ridge in. But there are so many, there's a disproportionate amount of infantry casualties that the Canadian Army had not prepared to make good. And as a matter of fact, that was one of the big problems. Most of the casualties they figured would come into the armor rank, the ranks of the armor, believe it or not. So as a result, when you finish the Battle of Verrier, you are short on infantry reinforcements. And the Black Watch literally starts scraping the barrel to get whatever they can, and so does the Canadian Army. So by the time you reach you know, late summer, early fall, you are getting a massive reconversion. So people who were in light anti-aircraft, uh, you know, bakers, uh, you know, candlestick makers, shoemakers are now being thrust into the front lines and being retrained very quickly to be infanteers. So it has a dramatic impact also on the Black Watch because uh, some people have said that that is pretty much the end of the territorial exclusivity of the Black Watch. It really is no longer a Montreal regiment after Verrier because now you have to recruit from right across Canada and anywhere else to fill those ranks. And I would argue it's not a bad thing, to be honest with you. You know, we get some of the best and brightest people from across the country associated with the regiment, but at the same time, you have to remember that a lot of the men that were coming in, particularly to the Black Watch, because they suffered the most, were rather reluctant to be there. They didn't sign on to be carrying a rifle uh, in you know a frontline infantry they were you know trained to fire an anti-aircraft weapon or trained as engineers or medics or whatever else and now they're being thrust into the front line but i think to get to your second question one of the reasons why we don't tend to look at this is because it is it it, it is a painful chapter but it, it sounds weird because df we you know we commemorate all the time but I think part of this also had to do with the end of the war with politics and with history. And remember that Guy Simmons continues on in command. He continues on throughout all of Northwest Europe. And when he finishes being the senior corps commander in the Canadian Army, he expects to be the first Canadian gen chief of the general staff as soon as the war is over. The Army commander, Harry Creer, is retiring. Everybody expects Harry's just going to tap him on the shoulder. But of course, people don't realize, uh, except if you're in the army in high command, that Creer and Simmons hate each other. There is a Simmons and a Creer clique, and there's no mixing. It's like prison gangs. You just don't <laughs> deal with each other. So as a result, uh, Charles Fawkes, our division commander, remember the one who was fantastic at brown nosing? Well, he <laughs> ends up being selected by Creer as the first chief of the general staff after the war, which Simmons considers to be a massive slap in the face. And so as a result, when the history of this is starting to be written in the end of the war in late 19 or mid 1945 and into 1946, Simmons is smarting. Simmons realizes he will never become chief of the defense staff unless he massages his legacy. And he starts doing this sadly with what happens here at Verrier. He refuses to accept responsibility for his plan. He blames it, and unfortunately, he does have a reputation for doing this, blaming his subordinates, particularly ones that die and can't answer back. And so he ends up blaming the fate of the Black Watch on the Black Watch themselves. And so as a result, um, he starts meddling. We have, um, you know, kind of like uh, SLA Marshall and, uh, you know, your, your official historians in the United States. We had a fantastic one by the name of C.P. Stacy, yeah. Colonel Stacy, who you probably read if you read anything on Can Canadians in Normandy, you know it's Stacy. Stacy had a historical team working on this. And Stacy was in a very difficult position because even though he was a professor of history, I think he was at Yale, as a matter of fact, when he joined the army, he was actually a colonel subject to the chain of command. 
So there's complete conflict of interest when it comes to Simmons, because Simmons was asking for his reports, his historical reports, and of course the narrative he was writing. And then he would write back to Stacy and say, nah, I don't like this. Please downplay this, change that, do this. So he acted That's exactly. how good history is written, right? Well, yeah, and, and to be honest with you, the reason that we know about this, and the reason that I could challenge this and take this on, is because C.P. Stacy understood what the hell was happening, and he put everything in his diary, okay. <laughs> which was brilliant. Yeah. In other words, he left Don't mess with a historian. Footprint. No, we'll, no, we'll mess your legacy up forever. Oh, Don't mess with historians. Yeah. So anyway, that's what he ended up doing, but part of it was the damage was done. In other words, you know, Varia Ridge was considered to be a real negative thing. It was, it was horrible. It was the second deadliest day next to Dieppe. But, you know, it was one of those things where, you know, the war eventually, two weeks later, hey, you know, the Germans collapse in Normandy. You know, there were better things on the horizon, if you will. And it kind of got swept Gets under the lost. rug. Yeah. Yeah, yeah, it did. You know, but, yeah. I, I was just going to say, look, I'm sorry, I didn't mean to interrupt you, but but uh, as we're, we're, we're getting close here, but I, I want to just, you know, we talked about casualties and we talked about the numbers and 97% uh, casualties that day and out of 300 men, 126 killed and the rest uh, wounded, uh, uh, taken prisoner. And there's a great visual that you have in your book, and I'm going to throw it up here. And this is just the officers, yeah. the officers of the Black Watch taken in May 1944, two months before this, and you can see a K for those who are killed, mm -hmm. a W for those who are wounded. And that's your visual. Those are your leaders, those are your officers, and that tells the whole story to me. This is just a, this is just a nightmare. Yeah, that's, that's the price in the officer corps for uh, seven days in Normandy for the Black Watch, right there. And it's amazing to think about it because, you know, we, you know, we were a relatively small country. We still are, um, you know, potent, but small. And, um, you know, we only had 8 million people, yet we had close to 800,000 men in uniform and women in uniform at that time. So one in 10 was walking around in a uniform. So you can imagine what it was like for the post-war when you have these people who would eventually go on to be not only the captains of industry, but professors and politicians and the leaders in society who are being just mowed down on these fields. It's very similar to what, you know, the, the lost generation out of Great Britain at the end of World War I. What could these men have done? You know, how would Canada have been different? Maybe it would be better, maybe it would be worse, but it would have been different for sure. And, you know, we tend to forget that. And it's the same thing with the United States, a whole generation, you know, a whole generation of leaders, of innovators, thinkers, you know, they're, they're all lost. Well, well. <laughs> well I, 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 I was going to wrap up, Chris, unless you have a last question you no, want to ask. I was just going to tell everybody to please, please, please read the book, find out about this part of the Normandy yeah, campaign. Yeah. Yeah, we have really just more more. scratched the surface, yeah. and, and this is still only one part of the Canadian campaign. We talked with Tim Cook a couple of weeks ago about, mm. uh, about some of Canada's efforts, and I think all of our audience knows a lot more about and, and can appreciate a lot more about what Canada did uh, during World War II. Um, and uh, and, it, and it, it's pretty amazing stuff. So, uh, David O'Keefe, thank you so much for joining yeah. us today on History thank Happy you. Hour. I hope you thank you for having me. Hope you were able to finish your single malt there. And, <laughs> Get uh, there. I'm if, getting there. If not, if not, you can. And again, his book is Seven Days in Hell: uh, Canada's Battle for Normandy and the Rise of the Black Watch Snipers, which is a whole other interesting part of this story. So, and there's a documentary as well that you can find on YouTube about the Black Watch snipers. Uh, and uh, David's part of that as well. So thank you so much for joining us. Thanks, David. Thanks, guys. Cheers. Good luck. Take care. Cheers. <sighs> wow. Wow. Yep. So we're going to, we, we promised a little something at the end here. Is it's going to be a, a dramatic change of pace, I think. But I, I will say, and the good transition here is we got a couple of photos from uh, one of our viewers uh, we did. this week, we did, of the Canadian Cemetery in, right. uh, in Normandy. And that is unfortunately and sadly where a lot of members of the, uh, the Black Watch Black ended up. Uh, uh, because, uh, and it's, it's not far from the objective 
that they had on that day on, on Verrier Ridge. And those were sent to us by Xavier Ruiz. And Xavier yeah. is, uh, some of you may have seen Xavier's comments in the comment area, and Xavier uh, is uh, a, a journalist. And, and Xavier recently uh, also wrote about History Happy Hour, Chris. We're famous in Spain. Because he's the, he's, uh, the founder of uh, this uh, fantastic uh, news site. And he wrote about, about let me, I'll bring, I'll bring Xavier on here to, uh, to talk to us about it. Xavier, how are you doing? Hi, how are you? We're great. Greetings and from Barcelona, Spain. Let me, if I, I have just, just let me tell you just one thing that if uh, uh, Chris Anderson and Rick Bayer are about to ask some questions, uh, wait a minute. I'm ready. I'm ready. <laughs> wait a minute. I can't, okay. <laughs> Savior is got attacked by his helmet. It, it, it's authentic, eh? I bought it in, in Normandy two years ago. Wait a minute. <laughs> okay. There we go. Okay. We need it. It's not from no. the landing, but it's no, authentic. No, okay. That'll okay. do. Okay. That'll do. I'm, I'm ready to ask, uh, well, to answer your questions. Well, I just want, we just mostly wanted to thank you. So Xavier wrote about us in, in his own, uh, the, the, the uh, digital news site that he has founded, which is e-notices, e is that, I think, what it's yeah, called? Yeah, e-news, e-news in English. In, and, uh, yes, and, uh, and so there's an article about History Happy Hour. It's our first piece of international publicity uh, <laughs> in, in, in which Xavier said that we were crazy about history, which I think there's no argument about. We're, we're locos por la historia. And, and Chris, uh, did, did you love this, Chris? I mean, I just want to put this out there. Oh, absolutely. That we are historiadors. You know, we're not historians. It sounds better. It sounds better. It just it, we, it sounds better. And uh, um, Xavier, we just uh, appreciate you've been a very enthusiastic viewer the last few weeks, and you've you've been tweeting about the show and everything, and written about the show. And we just want to say how much we appreciate that. Yeah, I discovered just uh, two months ago, but I think it's the best program on YouTube. At least of, about history. Let me show you something. Just, just a <laughs> minute, no. This is, a, this is my, my books. Oh, wow, wow. Uh, Churchill, uh, Holocaust, uh, second, well, this is uh, English literature. <laughs> and, and, right. and Xavier's invited uh, everybody. Holocaust, uh, General, uh, Japan, uh, but I have, I have <laughs> American Civil War over there. Wow. The, the picket charge. Ah, there are pickets charge. <laughs> I love the sliding <laughs> bookshelves. I gotta get that, Chris, because because th there's not enough room for another level. But okay. Again, uh, Nuremberg, uh, Stalingrad. Uh, what else? Uh, uh, Roman Empire. Uh, I, I gotta bring I gotta bring David back here. I gotta bring David back here. What do you th What do oh, you think of this? Great. Isn't this awesome? Yeah, I'm trying to figure out know. how to work this with the wife now. I know. I gotta figure out. Yeah, I'm trying to figure out. Yeah, I got a, I got a couple of walls in the basement that need. To I work. I want to talk to your architect, yeah. Xavier, yeah. and find out how to do that. Yeah. So, I'm a fan of history as well as you know. Well, the problem is, Mr. Otif, it's a, it's a pleasure to know you. I had to buy your book, but not the last one. The first one about the F. I was in the F two years ago. It's a Canadian okay. tragedy, though. Know? Uh, so yes, there was they, they had a raging conversation on the chat while we were talking as, as Xavier was trying to find uh, an ebook version available in Spain for less than 98 euros. So I think he succeeded okay. in the end. So yeah, I bought it. I bought it less expensive. That's fabulous. <laughs> but uh, but. <laughs> But Xavier, again, thank you so much for uh, for uh, giving us a little shout out uh, on your That's website. Wonderful. We thank really appreciate it, and uh, we hope we'll live up to your uh, the reputation you've given us. Thanks to you. Happy birthday! Can, can, can I make just a suggestion? Uh, in the in May is the, uh, the bicentenary of the death of Napoleon. I don't know if you can, for example, Andy Roberts, who have it already. He has a very good uh, biography about Napoleon because he has. He has. He was reading the uh, about uh, thirty thousand uh, private correspondence. Yeah, private we we yeah. probably can't get to it in May, but we, we will get to it. So Xavier, and thank you so much. I will give you. I will send you this book about the American Civil War. It's written. It's, it's in Spanish. It's not for the program. I think you, I don't know if you are able to to read the Spanish, but it's a very good book about the, the well. About Excellent. The very cool. Uh, and Miss uh, Miss uh, uh, Mr. Henderson. Mr. Anderson, sorry for my... Mr. My Anderson, book. yeah, Chris. I have a book for you as well, but it's a surprise. 
<laughs> All right. Oh, yours is a surprise. Xavier, thank you so much for joining us. Really appreciate it. And David, thank you again for joining us. And uh, thank you, everybody, for joining us. What a packed show that was. Uh, nice. uh, highs and lows and ups and downs uh, all over the place. Uh, and next week, Chris, we are going to uh, uh, talk about the emergence of amphibious warfare. So we all think of amphibious warfare as if it started on D-Day. Uh, yep. Turns out it didn't. It didn't. So we're going to talk about that next week on, uh, on History Happy Hour. Great. Looking forward to it. All right. Take care. Be, be safe, everyone.